Well, it's really great to be here. Hope you all can hear me, and maybe some of you can make out my accent. Thank you very much for uh, coming. It's a, a, an honor to be here, and it's been lovely to look around your campus for the first time. And we're looking at surprising aspects of uh, Jesus' teaching, and today we're going to deal with the surprising genius of Jesus. Um, you might think, well, Jesus is the Son of God, so we should expect him to know a lot. Right. But what I'm going to try to show you is how there's evidence of cleverness in the things he says that often have not been uh, spotted. So we're going to look at that. But first, we'll start with a quotation from this man. Um, and uh, this is what Elon Musk says, the limbic instinct for vengeance is incredibly strong, which is why turn the other cheek is such a powerful idea. Now, I don't know whether Mr. Musk knows the origin of that idea, but one of the things that struck me recently is just how many memes Jesus has created uh, in terms of things that have just really uh, gone viral, things that he's said that have really caught up in our culture. And so many of them just come from a single recorded uh, set of teaching, uh, Matthew 5 through to uh, 7. And, and um, this is just one example. And we're going to leave that all aside. And we're just going to look at three stories that Jesus told. That's all we're going to look at uh, today. First one is Jesus's shortest story, which is told in Matthew and in Luke. And I want us to look at whether Jesus actually told his shortest uh, parable. Well, I think, yes, he did. But can we uh, give some evidence for that? So let's look at it. It's 19 words in Matthew and it's 15 in Luke. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Okay, so the question is, you're having a discussion with someone who's uh, uh, unsure about the Bible. Did Jesus actually say that or not? Is there any reason you could give to say that Jesus said that, apart from the fact that it's in the Gospels? Well, one obvious thing is the word measure. It's the Greek word sarton, which is the uh, word for the Hebrew word seer or se'ah uh, in uh, Hebrew. And when Josephus mentions this measure, he has to explain what it is because dry measures and liquid measures just vary from place to place. Use the court over here. We don't use it in the UK. Uh, when we're talking about temperature, use Fahrenheit, we use Celsius, and just there are different ways of talking about different things in different places. Now, when you were doing dry measures, you'd have, in Italy, you'd have the modius, in Egypt, you'd have the artaba, and in Israel, you'd use the seer. So already we see just in this uh, little parable, the shortest one, uh, something that locates, geolocates this story. It makes sense if it's told in this particular setting. Now, what's so striking about this is that it mentions the seer, and the seer only occurs in six Old Testament passages. And I want you to notice the number of seers, because when you look through the Old Testament passages, you get different numbers of seers, and there's only one time that you get three seers. And the three seers occur with the same substance, namely flour. And all of the other ones are uh, with different substances, roast grain and things like that. So we look again at this and we see uh, several different features. One is we see that it's Palestinian, comes from the right city, uh, the right area. It's based on the Old Testament, three seers. Jesus got numbers in his parables frequently from the Old Testament. But also it says a woman hid three seers in flour and, and, uh, of, of, of yeast until it all leavened. Well, who's the woman who took the leaven there? Remember, it's Abraham comes along and he barks to his wife, quick. He doesn't even use a verb. Three seers of flour. Quick, I've got visitors I'm wanting to entertain very important, go off and do it. And what we see here is the first time, see as I mentioned in the Bible, that the fruit from Sarah's baking in the Bible has been absolutely massive, has it not? From that first meal, entertaining God and the angelic visitors, of course, came the promise of uh, the, the child, Isaac, and so much has happened since then. It's grown and grown and grown. So what we see, and you may think I'm reading too much into this, but you won't think later. Um, 
that from those three seers of flour, a lot has come. And I want to suggest to you that even in this short parable, we have geolocation, we have Old Testament reference, and we have something which is evocative, something which goes deeper, which hints at something further, which is a feature we find in Jesus' teaching. Okay, that's parable number one. We're going to come back to it. Parable number two, the parable of the temporary rich man and Lazarus. Now, some people call this the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Of course, he's not a rich man as soon as he gets to Hades, and he's never called a rich man as soon as he gets to Hades. He's a temporarily rich man, and that's a very important point. And it's just a sign of genius in the way the story is told that it knows the little detail to stop calling him the rich man. And it's part of our stupidity that we, and even some Bible translations do this, they keep on calling him a rich man after that point. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus knows how to do a lot with a few words. So it tells you at this story in Luke chapter 16, there was at this rich man's gate, um, at his gate was laid a poor man. Now, what's it tell you with that one word, passive, was laid? It tells you this man had a mobility disability without having to tell you he had a mobility disability. It never has to dwell on that because Jesus can do an awful lot with very few words. This is a sign of um, cleverness when you tell a story. He then goes on and it says, The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Who died first? the poor man. Poor people generally do die a bit sooner. And Jesus just has that happen in his parable without having to dwell on it. He also tells you the rich man was buried. Was the poor man buried? He leaves a gap there. And you're wondering, well, there's a possibility he was not buried and a possibility that he was buried, but it wasn't a big thing. But when the rich man died, it was a big thing. So you see how Jesus manages to say a lot with a very few words. Then we have this wonderful exchange where uh, the formerly rich man is in Hades uh, and uh, he is talking uh, to Abraham. And of course, he recognizes two people when he looks up from Hades. He recognizes uh, Lazarus, happens to know his name, by the way. And what do you do when you're in Hades and uh, there are two people you can see and one of them you've encountered before and the other you haven't? You talk to the one you haven't, yeah? Um, because he still thinks he's a rich man, so he needs to talk to Abraham, because Abraham's a rich man, and says, send Lazarus, that sort of errand boy, um, uh, to dip a bit of water and put it on my tongue. And uh, Abraham says, that's impossible. Um, At which point he says, well, okay, send him to my five brothers. Now, the audience in Luke's gospel here is recorded as being scribes and Pharisees, tax collectors and sinners. Scribes copy out the Bible. They know the Bible particularly well. What do the scribes think of when you say the number five? I mean, is there anything to do with their job on a day-to-day basis which involved the number five? Oh, maybe it could be the five scrolls of Moses, yeah? And, And so this man says, I've got five brothers, Father Abraham. He calls him again three times. He calls him Father Abraham, Father Abraham. How many children does Abraham have? How many offspring does Abraham have? As many as the stars. Dude, you made a mathematical mistake. Basic mathematical mistake. If you want to call Abraham your father, you've got far more than five brothers. Look at the law of Moses. And so you have all this brilliance in Jesus' story as this man makes terrible uh, calculations because he thinks he's only got five brothers that he can call Abraham his father, but not count Lazarus as his brother. Okay. Now, when we look at this story, we also see that there are allusions to the Old Testament, because it tells you that the rich man used to feast uh, every day clothed in purple and fine linen. Well, again, if you are a student of the Scriptures, you know that purple and fine linen only come up together in the Bible in the book of Esther. And uh, one, of the, one of those places that they come up, funnily enough, is where Ahasuerus, Xerxes the king, is feasting for 180 days together. And that's where you've got purple and linen. Um, and so what you've got there is a sense that this man is treating himself like a king. But of course, in the book of Esther, Ahasuerus invited all of the men of um, the citadel, to come to the party at the end. So whereas this man never invited Lazarus in, Ahasuerus, that mean king, 
was actually far more generous. It also echoes the book of Job. You see, there's that. how do you translate that bit at the beginning of Job when it talks about what Job's sons were doing? Remember, he's got seven sons, three daughters at the beginning. And it says they used to have a feast at the brother of each, uh, each of the brothers on his day. Well, I think it's a seven-day week, and they're actually feasting every day. So the one place we get in the Bible where people are feasting every day, it's Job's sons, and guess what? It's a sibling-only feast. And then what we see in the story of uh, the uh, temporary rich man and Lazarus is that Lazarus is covered with sores. Well, who in the Bible is covered with sores? There's only one person covered with sores. That's Job. Is he rich or poor? He's rich. Is Abraham rich or poor? He's rich. Is there anything wrong with being rich? No. Abraham's uh, uh, rich and he's favoured by God. Job was rich and he was favoured by God. There's a problem with being rich and not inviting the people round. That's the problem. And then we see that it says he lifted up his eyes, the formerly rich man, lifted up his eyes from Hades and saw Abraham afar off. Now, again, remember scribes, Jewish scribes, notice similar phrases. That's the way that they're working. They're always noting parallel phrases. Where in the Bible do we get someone lifts up their eyes from afar and sees? Well, we get it twice. Where do we get it? Once we get it, uh, where we get uh, that um, the friends of Job come along and they lift up their eyes from afar and they see him. The other time, even more striking, we get it in the case of Abraham. You remember how Abraham is called to offer up his son Isaac, and there it says in Genesis chapter 22 that on the third day he lifted up his eyes, and by the way, he's the guy in the Old Testament who lifts up his eyes the most. He lifted up his eyes and he saw afar off. So you've got four things in common in that text. You've got lifting up, eye, lifting up eyes from afar and Abraham. So Jesus is building in these allusions into his story which if you're a scribe, you should spot, and they actually have moral impact when you reflect on what they mean. So um, then I've noticed already that he calls out Father Abraham lots and lots of times, and of course, he doesn't accept Lazarus's brother. Okay, so that's a sort of warm up with a couple of Jesus' story. Now let's go for Jesus' longest parable, which is uh, Luke chapter 15, uh, 388 words long, about two and a half minutes to uh, uh, read out loud uh, in English. So it's a pretty short story. That's the longest story we've got. Uh, we've already looked at Jesus' shortest story. And we need to start again by thinking about the audience. The audience is introduced in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 2, where it says, Now tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And of course, there we've got the fact that the tax collectors and sinners are drawing near. Uh, near and far are going to be very important. And scribes and Pharisees are grumbling, which is what Israel did in the desert. So we've got these two groups of two. Tax collectors... They're interested in money. You don't expect them to know the Bible particularly well. And as for sinners, they're interested in sin. So they probably don't spend that much time on the Bible. I mean, th to, to be a sinner like this, you know, to get, actually get quotation marks in modern Bibles, we'll talk about that another time. Um, uh, I, I guess you have to be in formal, flagrant breach of the Old Testament law or of later uh, rules. Um, then we've got our Pharisees who uh, we, we know are, pride themselves on their separation and on their righteousness and scribes whose job it is, amongst other things, to copy out the scriptures. They actually count and distinguish particular phrases. So part of Jesus' genius is his ability to teach mixed ability. <laughs> the fact that you've got people in the audience at different points and he's able to send messages to them simultaneously. Because the amazing thing about this the story of the two sons, the parable of the prodigal son, is that it works even if you have no background at all in the Bible. It works. It can go from culture to culture and be told as a simple story, and you, you get it. It doesn't require any special insight um, to get it. And um, that first 62%, which is about the younger son, um, uh, appeals to lots of uh, people, but there's also that final 38% about the older brother, which uh, is pretty hard-hitting as well. 
But he begins, if you like, with a couple more stories, doesn't he? Which we could call, and I'm not being disrespectful, warmer pacts. Because you begin with the parable of the lost sheep, Luke chapter 15, where one out of a hundred sheep is lost. And it is lost by going away from home. Then you have one out of ten coins lost at home. Then we're going to have a story of a son lost going away from home and I think a story of a son lost at home. Now, you know about Sudoku. With Sudoku, you fill in the missing bits. And Jesus' story has this missing ending. Because when you get to the parable of the two, the two sons, uh, you have the father talking to the older brother at the end, and you don't know the older brother's response, do you? So you're left wondering, how would he respond? But you, we can use the Sudoku principle to fill in the ending because we know what would happen if he responded right. Because just as there was rejoicing when the sheep that was lost going away uh, was found, and there was rejoicing when the coin at home was found. Therefore, if that older brother came back, there would also be rejoicing. The Sudoku principle. And again, that's the brilliance of Jesus to be able to communicate like that. Also, by the way, it's hard to plot a graph when you've only got two data points. But one way you could look at it is this. And if you're a tax collector, you might well look at this. First sheep, 1%. Uh, next is coin, 10%. What's the next percentage I'm getting after that? It's going to be 100%, isn't it? So one loss, 1% 1 lost, 10% lost, 100% lost. It all adds up. Brilliance of Jesus' uh, stories like this. <clears throat> so, the story begins. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to, uh, to me. And he divided his property between them. Them. Did you hear that word? That's so important. This uh, father is a fair father. He's not just going to give the younger son his inheritance. He's going to give that to the older son. Now, what's the legal uh, background to this? What country does it take place in? We don't know. It's a story. But if it took place in Israel, an older brother's going to get double. And on any sort of farming model, well, you don't just keep on dividing farms into smaller lots. Uh, on any farming model, in lots and lots of different countries, the younger son would get the movable, some of the movable stuff, and the older brother does re really well out of this. Therefore, the older brother should be grateful for the rest of his life because the younger brother did the dirty work for him. <laughs> he went and asked dad, and he won the jackpot out of this. Wow, brother, I, am, I love you so much. You know, you asked dad for that, and I got my inheritance early. Thank you. I'm forever in your debt. You know, if you ever need anything, bro, just call me. That's not quite his response, but... That could have been or should have been. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Jesus tells this story and we see all sorts of amazing features to it. For instance, the younger son ends up feeding pigs. Now, if you're a Pharisee and you think that people who dishonor their parents are really going to deserve what they get, you're pretty pleased with th this story. It's going well at this point. So emotionally, you're absolutely on side. So that's an, an intelligent element to what Jesus is doing. He's getting that audience on side. They're saying, yeah, that's great, feeding pigs, just where he deserves to be. But actually, Jesus says something a bit more profound. He says, when he had spent everything, severe famine rose in that country, and he began to be in need. There's a brilliance about the began, the use of the word begin, which implies something uh, more uh, lasting. But there's also the famine. Now, what's interesting about this is that uh, you know, tests have been done on groups which show that people from contexts where there is no famine are less likely to remember there is even a famine in this story. Why does the younger son end up feeding pigs? There are two answers to this. One, because he wasted his money and it was his own fault. Two, because he was ba had bad luck. Okay? Now, let me just dwell on that second answer. Because what it says is that the poor lad made some really dumb choices, but he happened to choose to go away to the one land, the one country, which was hit by a severe famine. That's pretty bad luck, isn't it? So we don't actually have the scenario where he made bad choices and there was no famine. 
So whereas the older brother thinks that his trouble is entirely of his own making, Jesus tells a story which says a lot of his trouble was of his own making, but it wasn't entirely of his own making, which is a really interesting thing to do. It actually something that we often forget about. We can judge all sorts of people for what's uh, gone wrong in their lives because of their own choices, forgetting also that, and I'm using this word luck in a non-technical sense, we've had better luck than them. Okay, then we have this bit in the story where it says that he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. What an amazing vocabulary choice Jesus makes, because... uh, That word implies exclusion of those who are not citizens. It's a brilliant word there. Or we read that they, he began to be in need, or they began to celebrate. That party went on for a long time. It tells you the older brother was in the field, but doesn't tell you what he was doing. But we all know what he was doing, don't we? We know he was working. So it's another way that Jesus makes the words do much more work than just on the page. He makes them actually feed our imaginations. Then we see the way that um, the older brother finally responds to the father. He says, look, these many years I've served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. What's so interesting about that first word out of the older brother's mouth is the missing word. If you've read this story carefully, you've seen that every single time the younger son talks to his father or even rehearses in a speech in his head to his father, the first word out of his mouth is what? Father. So here we have an amazing missing word that he's not saying father. He says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. By the way, it's actually been building up your own business, not slaving for your father. And you never gave me a young goat. I've been vegetarian this whole time. No, mate, you're on a farm. You haven't been vegetarian the whole time. He says, you never gave me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. He wants to have this celebration. And what's so significant about this is not the having of the meat, but it's the having of the meat with his friends in the absence of his father. That's the important thing. He's been able to have friends around the farm all the time, but it hasn't tasted as good when his father's there. So you see that this older son is physically close, but emotionally, spiritually distant. So this is how Jesus says a lot with a few words, and I've already talked about the missing ending. Now I want to show you another level, which is how Jesus stretches the scribes. So he's got people who copy out the scriptures there. How does he engage with them? Well, he is telling this story against the background of lots of Old Testament stories. There was a man who had two sons. Who in the Old Testament is the most famous person to have had two and only two sons? Well, that would be Isaac, wouldn't it? Um, And uh, Isaac has that younger son who got the inheritance. He cheated his older uh, son. The older son was so angry, he had to go off into a far country where he herded animals. The older brother was angry. And you can't read this story easily without being Uh, finding it evoking, um, uh, hinting at the story of uh, Jacob and Esau. And there are some contrasts, because uh, there often are in the way Jesus uses the Old Testament. So that whereas in Jesus' story, this uh, man goes out with a lot and comes back with nothing, in the Old Testament, of course, uh, Jacob went off with very little and came back with a lot. But there's a bit more we can say, because we can see how Esau is associated with the field in the Old Testament. We also can say that that phrase that the younger son uses, here I am dying of hunger, who said here I am dying of hunger before in the Bible? Well, that would be Esau when he came in just about to get tricked out of his uh, birthright. Uh, But there's a bit more, and this is the surprising thing. So the, the dramatic high point of the story is when the father runs, embraces, and kisses the son. Now, what's so striking is if you're a scribe, there's only one place in the entire Old Testament where anyone ever runs, embraces, and kisses someone. That exact phrase. That is when Esau runs and embraces and kisses his brother Jacob. It's absolutely stunning. It is, I think, the most surprising narrative turn in the entire Old Testament. Because Esau's coming 
towards him with 400 armed men, you're expecting the worst. Uh, Jacob's clearly expecting the worst. You have a whole lot of narrative about how Jacob's dealing with, in contingency plans about how to protect his family. So you really are expecting something very bad. And then you get this absolute complete reversal where he runs, embraces, and kisses. Now, what's so striking about this is that this verse was at the high point of the drama of Jesus' story and a key point in scribal education at the time of Jesus. So this is what I want to argue. Here we have two codices. Uh, on the left, we have the Leningrad Codex. On the right, we have one of the earliest Pentateuchs in the British Library. And there, just next to those uh, arrows on the left, you can see the word wa yisha kehu, and he kissed him with six dots over them. And he kissed him from the word nashak with a uh, suffix uh, there. And he kissed him. This was one of the key points of scribal training uh, where you have what are called extraordinary points, puncta extraordinaria. And I think that we can argue that these go back to the time of Jesus. And what we can say about them is that they are throughout the Hebrew tradition. So there are two common ways of handing down uh, the Old Testament. One is on a scroll like this. When you have a scroll, it doesn't have the vowel points on. The other one is the codex like this, which does have the vowel points in. In both of those separate traditions, they have these points over the top. So even if you don't have any vowel points, you have these points, those later scrolls. They're in the two different Masoretic traditions of the Ben Asher and the Ben Naphtali. They're used as a feature in the Dead Sea Scrolls, these points, not over this verse, but elsewhere. And they're even mentioned in a Greek manuscript. They're mentioned in the Talmud and in the Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah is like, let's say, from the year 200 with earlier traditions. Already by the time of the Mishnah, it talks about one of these points, and it had completely forgotten the real origin, because these things come from earlier. So this is the amazing thing, to be able to build a story where the dramatic high point is also part of the high point of the training. Because there are only 15 sets of these points in the entire Old Testament. There are um, 10 in the Pentateuch and there are five in Genesis. This particular bit was something that the scribes would have known very well. And that's an amazing part of the way Jesus is able to engage with them. There are lots of softer connections between uh, Jesus' story and the Old Testament there. Well, the man had two sons, older brother coming in from the field, saying he's dying of hunger, cheating out of his inheritance. The young goats, that's really interesting. There's only two points in the Bible where people are having young goats as meals. One is when, uh, you remember, Rebecca cooks the young goats for um, Jacob to take in uh, to trick his father. You never gave me a young goat. That's the only other times we get it mentioned as um, uh, meal uh, 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 food. Now, we also find that in Jesus' story, the father says, bring out the best robe. Well, who does the best robe belong to? There are two options, either the father or the older brother, right? But isn't it interesting that when Jacob tricks his, old, his father, who cannot see afar off, by the way, Isaac, can only see up close. He is wearing his brother's robes. Isn't it so striking? And then we have what any scribe ought to notice. The phrase drew near coming up six different times in that Genesis narrative as he draws near to his father. Um, of course, draw near is what the older son uh, does in this story. Well, you can read all of this and more uh, in a book that's coming out in October called The Surprising Genius of Jesus. Um, there's a bit more I just want to deal with, with Esau. Um, we know Esau was staying at home waiting for his father to die. Uh, and later, he is the one who forgave his brother who had cheated him out of everything. So there's a moral lesson to person uh, if Esau. Esau goes down in history, rightly, as a baddie, right? He, he despised his birthright. But even he forgave his little brother who cheated him out of everything. That is a real challenge. That's a bit more. You see, think of the Laban story. In a seven-verse cluster in the Old Testament, in Genesis, uh, um, uh, sorry, in, 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 in 
Luke 15, uh, you get a lot of references to uh, the story of uh, Laban. Uh, I'm giving you some of those in a table. One of the most striking things is this. Remember how the older son says, all these years I've been working for you, and he's really angry. Well, who gets angry with the father figure and says, all these years I've been working for you? That would be Jacob. Um, and so you find that Jesus is drawing on uh, this uh, particular form of language. When the uh, older brother says, this son of yours who's devoured your livelihood with prostitutes, devouring livelihood is a phrase that, again, is used by Laban's uh, daughters uh, and so on. Um, and as for working for no pay, I seem to remember that's something that Jacob does for his um, father-in-law. So uh, working for no pay also comes up in Jesus' story. So um, that's one set of references, and there's a bit more to spend time on that. But let's pass on to another lot. This is uh, the figure of Joseph. Um, you see, the father says, quick, bring out the robe and bring out the ring. Where is the only other passage in the Bible that you get robe and ring suddenly brought out? The only other sudden rags to riches story in the Bible, uh, sudden, sudden permanent rags to riches story, is the story of Joseph coming out of prison uh, before Pharaoh. And what's so striking there is even the Nestle Aland uh, Greek New Testament in its margin will give you a reference to Genesis 41, 42. It sees there has been an absolutely clear reference. So Jesus fills his story with references to the Jacob Esau narrative and some to the Laban narrative, but also to the Joseph story. Because, of course, Joseph is the story that takes place in a time of great famine. And this is the most important point. Um, well, there, there are some nice contrasts, like no, um, no one gave food to the prodigal and Joseph gave food to everyone. But Joseph also went into a far country. And he's the only other son that the father thought was dead and alive again. So you've got a lot of this story of Jesus that I think is actually playing off this Old Testament story. Um, and there's a moral lesson there. Think of all that Joseph forgave his brothers for. Then there's that, what the older brother says. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who uh, came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you fattened, uh, killed a fattened calf for him. Well, there's only, you get three words there together, don't you? Young goat, friends, and prostitutes. Where do we get young goat, friend, and prostitutes together? There's only one passage in the Old Testament. It's that uh, wonderful Genesis chapter 38, which I know we read uh, regularly. It's about Judah having to send the goat uh, you know, to pay for the prostitute who isn't a prostitute, and, and so on, with his friend. And those things all happen together. Now, you just look at the even getting goats, young goats and friends together is pretty hard. They don't, that doesn't happen much. Oh, young goat and prostitute together. Yeah, okay, maybe once in the Samson story. But getting friends, young goat and prostitute together, all in one section, all in just these few verses, it's hard not to hear it. Now, this is the thing. Judah was sexually misbehaving in the Holy Land while his brother Joseph was in a far country sexually behaving, resisting Mrs. Potiphar. So if you're a scribe, think of this. There's a deep challenge in Jesus' reference to this. How can the older brother possibly know that the younger brother was spending his time with prostitutes. The, old, the younger brother's not been sending back postcards. You know, uh, here I am down at the brothel. The younger brother has been dead. There's been no communication. And he's only just come in from the field. He's not even had a conversation with anyone. So how could he possibly know what has been the main expense of the younger brother? There's only one source of the information, isn't there? It's called the imagination. So what we're seeing here is the older brother's heart. His heart is revealed and it's laid bare. Now Judah, in Genesis 38, he is the ancestor of the Jews. He's the one that they see as the great father figure. But remember, O oh Pharisees and scribes, your great father figure and what he was like. Think about your heart. And of course, the wonderful story of Judah is a story of redemption and how Judah really comes round uh, and uh, finally offers himself as a servant. And then there is reconciliation with his brother, Joseph. Um, 
So there's a lot in that story, and uh, we can uh, dwell on that as well. But I want to show you another story. You notice these all coming from one book, all coming from Genesis. Did you realize this story is based on the story of Abraham? Um, a man had two sons. Now, if we're not going to go on a very, very strict definition, you're allowed to have more sons later, okay? A man had two sons. It could be Adam. It could be Abraham. A man had two sons. Well, Abraham certainly had two contrasting sons. And Abraham is the archetypal father. He's mentioned there as father in the very next chapter of Luke, isn't he? But this we remember. What's the very first word? Unfortunately, not in the ESV. But the very first word out of the father's mouth in Luke 15. It's quick. That's the very first word out of Abraham's mouth back in Genesis 18, verse 6. The three guests come along. Quick, three seers of flour. Oh, Jesus had thought about that verse. Right? Quick, three seers of flour. And what's so striking about that is it's quick, three seers of flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf. Who's the only other old guy in the Bible to run? Oh, that would be Abraham. And he's running to get a fatted calf. Now, don't you think the scribes had noticed that Abraham was running age 99? Do you think he ever commented on that? This is quite striking. Now, we don't know how old the father is in the story, but we know, you know, it's been a generation. He, he's too old to run, like me. Okay. There are a number of first occurrences that happen in Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18 where, remember, Abraham does the f Bible's first entertainment. I'm sort of discounting Melchizedek here for a moment. Actually welcome people in, okay? Uh, first entertainment, and therefore, God's no man's debtor, and so he puts Abraham in charge of the heavenly feast, okay? Seems fair deal, doesn't it? God's very gracious, isn't he? Okay? But this is the very first running in the Bible. Now, if you're a scribe, you notice the first time you come across a particular verb, okay? He runs more than once. It's the first hospitality. It's the first time someone says, quick. First time you've got a fatty calf in the Bible. You've got more. Only other old guy in the Bible to run first time. Someone begins a speech with quick, leads to a fatted calf, and we know Jesus thought about the three seers. So we've got all of these things linking the story with Abraham. Uh, and uh, we've already looked at those, so that's fine. But there's a little bit more. You see, Abraham didn't allow his two sons to inherit equally. In the Abraham story, the younger son, Isaac, inherited everything. Abraham is the only other father in the Bible to give away his inheritance while he's still alive. Don't you remember those verses? It says, Genesis 25, Abraham gave all he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the east country. So don't you think when you start having the bizarre situation of a father giving away his inheritance while it's still alive, a scribe or two might not think of Oh, isn't there someone else who gave away their inheritance while they're still alive? That would be Abraham. Also, Abraham has an older brother, an older son, who won't celebrate for the younger son. Remember this? How does Ishmael lose his inheritance? It's like this. Abraham does a feast for the weaning of Isaac, and it says in Genesis 21... And the child Isaac grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that he was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. So in other words, the um, loss of inheritance comes through despising the feast for the younger brother. We have so many contrasts there, I'm not even going to spend time on this. Because I want to get on to the next story. This is the final one from Genesis. Cain and Abel. A man had two sons. Think of it. Adam. The Bible's first brothers, the first family conflict. The older brother associated with the field, the younger brother with the care of animals, and the older brother angry because the younger brother was accepted by God. Now, it seems to me that what Jesus has done is Jesus has recorded a story which is two and a half minutes long, which basically deals with all of Genesis's greatest hits. It's almost as if Genesis, as well as serving other purposes, was specially written to provide the prefabricated material for Jesus's story. Now, how could that happen? Because Genesis is written before. But if you didn't know which came first, Luke 15 or Genesis, you're just, you're just you know, 
um, civilization destroyed and you just find them and you spotted these links, which would you think came first? You'd think that Genesis is an expansion of Luke 15 because it's far easier to expand a story than to condense everything into a story where it's still coherent and makes sense. But every single word in Jesus' story in Luke 15 makes sense. Um, so what I want to say is, <clears throat> I've shown you some connections you might think not think are so convincing. That's fine. They don't all, they're not all equally convincing. I'm not saying one's a type of the other. I'm saying Genesis produ produces the mood music, the background, and uh, that Luke 15 evokes all those sorts of things. But there are some pretty clear connections. Joseph with the rings and the robe, Esau's run, embracing and kissing, Jacob, I've worked on these years, Abraham, quick and the fatted calf. And I think you get to have one clear reference or so at least every 20 seconds, like really clear, and dozens more layers I haven't had time to deal with. That's why I wrote a book. It's called The Surprising Genius of Jesus, and you can pre-order it from Amazon. Um, <coughs> and um, there's more than just packing a story with references. These references also mean something, because Esau had loads of reason for anger. He lost out as an inheritance. He forgave. Laban lost all his property, and he had to make peace and accept that Jacob was going to be blessed. Joseph, whose brothers had sold him, forgave them. And Ishmael, who despised the feast for the younger brother, he lost his inheritance. So the lessons for the scribes, Joseph was sold by the older brothers, um, but he forgave them, and that preserved their inheritance. Esau was cheated, but he forgave. Laban lost his inheritance, he made peace, and Ishmael lost everything. That's a repeat, isn't it? Oh, well. Um, <coughs> now, what can we conclude from this? <clears throat> One, Jesus knew the Old Testament really well. Now, you say, okay, he knows that because he's the Son of God. I, yeah, I got, I've got that. But I'm also saying you can demonstrate to others that he knew the Old Testament really well. He's able to teach multiple audiences simultaneously. That's impressive. It also shows that the stories have been handed down with integrity, the whole lot. This sort of genius story doesn't come from a committee. You can't do it. Because we're finding throughout every bit of this story, there are references to the Old Testament. And the Old Testament allusions are not superfluous. They make powerful points. Now, we can also say, by the way, it shows that this story was told to exactly the group that Luke said it was told to. Because there's absolutely no point packing your story with lots of references to things for scribes if you've got no scribes in the audience. So it really validates the setting that Luke has this in. Well, how can it all take place? Well, you just turn to the opening of John and the fact that Jesus is the Word. He is the creator of language and suddenly we can explain why this can be. Did the scribes notice all these references? I don't think so. I think a lot of scribes may have listened to Jesus' story and thought, well, that wasn't much of a story. I didn't like that. I mean, it's just so simple, so basic, so so on. But on the Day of Judgment, will they have an excuse? They've seen Jesus, the great teacher on display, what did he say so regularly when he began his teaching? Let the one who has ears to hear, hear. These references are there in a moral way. So that if you seek, you find. If you don't seek, you don't find. And so Jesus told this story, and I think it is the most remarkable story I know of. It's just breathtaking for me. And this is just one of many aspects of Jesus' absolute genius, and I think it should call forth for worship from us. Thank you.